Familia, welcome to the Latino Leadership Circle Cafecito Conversations for February 2022. We are happy to have you with us, and we are excited today because we just came off uh, the heels of an incredible lecture by Reverend Dr. Daisy Machado, Professor of History at Union Theological Seminary. She gave the keynote address at the Mama Leo inaugural conference, and uh, it was just fantastic. We enjoyed it. It, it was so, so rich. And uh, today, um, we have um, some folks that want to talk about it. They're our friends. Um, you all know them. We have Belinda Pasafaro from Washington, D.C. We have David Ramos from New York, New York, and we have Liz Rios from uh, Miramar, Florida. And so we are happy to really, not, not to analyze what's going on, but just to celebrate what Daisy lifts up in her, in her keynote. Just wonderful, wonderful things. We want to start with the, the, the name of the lecture. Daisy chose to use uh, as the title of the lecture, La Lucha Sigue o Cristiano. An old, old, if you're part of the Pentecostal tradition or the Baptist or evangelical tradition, uh, uh, Spanish evangelical tradition, you sang that song and how she was able to frame uh, the keynote with that theme was, was wonderful. What did you resonate with in the keynote? And I want to give it to my uh, esteemed colleagues. What did you resonate uh, with in the keynote right off the bat? Yeah, well, I, I mean, there were so many things that we could talk about, because, but because of the lack of time, you know, I'll, I'll point out what she mentioned about education, right? So um, definitely refer you back to listen to the whole uh, keynote speech. But one of the things she said was that um, our Latino people need to learn real history, and as we know right now, we have a controversy across the North America when it comes to real education, right? They, they, uh, there's some people that want to sell a narrative that's not real, and there's people that are, are fighting for real history to be taught in the classroom. And the reason why she said that that's important is because once you know your the real history, it's hard, it's hard for you to buy into the myths that have been um, perpetrated in our, with our people. Um, one of the things that she said was, you know, the, the types and the theology and the ideas that we continue to uh, share with people in our churches um, and in our circles really are, is embedded from Western theologians, missionaries, you know, mm -hmm. empire basically. So we are regurgitating information that's not even good for our, our people. And um, so that was one of the things that I thought was really important. Another thing that she mentioned related to education was um, she mentioned someone that we have no documents to, to, to research on. She only knew this person because it was a family friend and that was Belen Nieves. Yes. And she said that, that she learned um, from her and her parents that it doesn't matter how much credentialing or education you have if you don't have heart. And I think that's mm -hmm. important because as we are, uh, are lifting up education and we, we're saying that it's important, we also don't want it to be the only important thing. We want you to remember that heart is important as well. So it's head and heart that helps you to be a blessing to your people in your community. Um, so, so that to me is um, yeah. really important for all of us to remember. Let me connect a little bit with with Be Belen Nieves. That that really touched my heart also, mm -hmm. because in my life I also have um, strong uh, women uh, Pentecostal leaders. One of them was Celica de Jesus. Would we'll probably maybe in the future speak to about her and the work that she did in the Pentecostal movement. Um, I love the fact that the example of Belen Nieves impacted her. And, and she, she talks about her establishing the first church in, in, in Cuba, an AG church in Cuba uh, around the 1930s, around that time, and how it impacted her. 
And so part of the work that we're trying to do is trying to highlight, elevate these women leaders filled with the Holy Spirit, God, who God directed, so that it would impact other, right, sheroes in the future. And, and, mm -hmm. and so it, it's just incredible how it impacted her. And as a result, you know, we're, look where she is right now, too. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to connect with that. Yeah. Other, other thoughts, other, other, other things that you resonated with. One more thing about education. Um, this is why it relates to us here in the United States. Um, she, she said that Latinos have swallowed the myth of a Christian nation and Christian founders. And this is why we have nationalists today mm. willing to mm -hmm. have an insurrection. So I'm saying all of these things are related. And as we've sp spoken about many times, Sometimes people don't know what they don't know. And because you don't know, you don't, you don't look for it. But exactly. this is why it's so important to have the, the scholars and the people in our communities that are learning. And then not to, give, um, not to give up on our community, but to go back and to stay connected to a local church and give the information that you learned and give it back to the local church for those people that can't afford a uh, uh, seminary education, that can't give up time for a, a seminary education. You, everything that we do should always be connected back to our community. Elizabeth, I, I may piggyback on what you're saying. One of the things that really strike me as you share that is the tendency of us to doubt our own narratives, how we have adopted uh, foreign narratives. And, and just like theology is not a monolith, uh, sometimes we begin to say, you know, these are the narratives, these are the stories the storyline and 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 that becomes the paradigm by which we view reality as opposed to the lived reality of of our situation in, in our own communities and our culture mm -hmm. and as uh, dr machado was celebrating uh, mama leo and other uh, uh, heroes of the faith, it, it just it underscore the power of the virtue and the and the beauty and the resourcefulness, uh, the creativity and the stamina of these incredible women of faith. And uh, and and I, I was just so very excited uh, for the wonderful, passionate, thorough, and uh, heartfelt work that Daisy Machado shared during her lecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I think it's so important and I think Daisy stressed this too and let me just uh, say that it was such a joy for me while I was at Union to have Daisy as both my church history professor it was such an enlightening I will say even liberating a uh, semester for me because you can't fully understand where you are in terms of location um, until you understand where you've come from and still you understand and really uh, explore that narrative, that history, not the mythical info that we've been given, right? But explore the real history that has nurtured and and has played such a role in the time and place that we find ourselves in. Uh, but she also served as my dean while I was at Union Theological Seminary, and and her leadership was just stellar. And I just, as being one of the few Latina women at Union at that time, I just remember feeling so excited that we had our first ever female Latina Dean at an institution like Union Theological Seminary. So even her life and her example has been very groundbreaking. Um, and I've, I feel honored to have been able to bear witness uh, to her journey because I know she's that was helping to pave the way for so many of us following behind. But I as I consider sort of the historical part of this, right, there was so much that was that was learned here, too, that in 1914, women were already ordained. Yeah. But ordination did yeah. not mean equality. Mm. And I think that's really important as we think about the legacy of someone like Mama Leo, right? That while she was responding to the call of God on her life, like this is a woman who received visions from God and took that calling and boldly made her way here to the U.S. from Puerto Rico to live out this calling and to follow the spirit in the face of resistance, in the face of limited resources. She not only 
began to preach and had a growing ministry to what you know we would call the least of these right as as our bible tells us to to the poor to the addict to the sex worker right to those on the streets that were as we heard in her lecture at the bottom of the urban order where they were just not even part of the conversation ellos estaban afuera and we here we're in the church right we're worshiping we're loving Jesus. But here, she comes to the scene and she says, our church was like any other church. But God wants us to do this kind of work here. We're not called to say insular. We're called to go out. We're called to preach the good news to the poor, right? To heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberation for the captive, right? That beautiful um, verses in Isaiah 61. And not only does she have like the audacity, can we say, like that spiritual courage in a male-dominated structure, right? A male-dominated led um, setting. But she goes even further and says, we need to do something more here we are going to create the first church-sponsored drug rehab program in the United States. And in 1957, by faith, Mama Leo launched Youth Crusade, which, by the way, served as a model for other faith-based drug rehab programs throughout the country, including uh, David Wilkerson's Teen Challenge. Yeah. But we don't hear about Mama Leo, right? We hear about the teen challenges in the United States, but let's look at this warrior, this woman of God who moved with such bold faith to proclaim and to take all that God already promised to her through visions and through the word of God. And the other piece I want to share to that is that if we consider the historical context, right, when she created 1957, there was large migration of Puerto Ricans coming from the island due to the economic situation, right? That's what I would call a forced migration to this country. So in essence, as Dr. Machado mentioned, she sought to respond to disrupting and dismantling the familial and communal networks brought about by Puerto Rican migration brought about by the fractured sort of experience that we all had because we were neither home there and we didn't feel fully at home here and living in that in-between space that's so challenging. So she was really going against the full current and breathing life into a, a place of, of darkness and pain and, and dislocation and fear and insecurity. And she took the church to the streets. Amen. That is the beauty and power of her legacy that still challenges us today, right? The full gospel for the whole person, for the whole community. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. I remember when we when I did my chapter on her, um, that that her sister mentioned to me, because at the time she was very frail, she was not liked by the cops because she was working with the addicts. She was mm -hmm. not liked by the ministers because she, how dare she get on a pulpit and preach because she was a woman. And there were a lot of other Latina sisters who felt that she really shouldn't have stood up in that time. And she said, if I only had another sister to talk to, and I'm just wondering mm -hmm. today if this is something that we could learn from for everyone, that when we are um, seeing women rise and God is using them, that, that we are not those obstacles for them, that instead we're helping them, we're supporting yes. them, we're lifting them up. And that we're not those people that are constantly uh, throwing something at them. And, and, you know, she still did it because again, what was driving her was her call and her faith in the God that called her. And that's why so many other women are still doing it today. They're not listening to mm -hmm. the, the, the men that still to this day, 2022, are saying they should not be preaching. Thank God for the women out there that have the audacity, as you said, Belinda, to stand mm -hmm. up and say, God has called me and that is enough. 
that is enough and we yeah. need not any further affirmation. Punto, period. Yeah, I moved that uh, resilience, uh, how intrepid she was. And uh, and it's also a model for for not just women, for all of us who who are doing ministry and, and encounter obstacles to ministry. They're, they're haters and naysayers and, uh, and find all these reasons why people ought not to be involved. And, and they should just get out of the way from, from the people who are actually doing the ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she, I, I'm so happy that we're celebrating her life because she reminds me a little of Madre Teresa. Mother Teresa mm -hmm. had this famous quote that said, don't wait for leaders. Uh, do it on your own, uh, person mm -hmm. by person. And, uh, and Mama Amen. Leo, you know, she did that. She'd like to, Belinda's point, she took it to the street. Uh, it was talk about a contextualized incarnational ministry. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, she, she was she she was sent by, by the Lord. And all of us need to be aware that we will encounter uh, resistance and, and we're going to encounter criticism. And, uh, and we can become discouraged until we remember who sent us to this and who are we serving. And I believe Amen. that Mama Leo's heart to, to the least of these, the, the least, the lost and, and uh, left behind is what motivated her and and that's why we can celebrate her legacy amen. amen 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 i'd like to quote daisy when she says these were daring and fearless women who dared the impossible mm -hmm. yes. fearless women who dared the impossible daisy also speaks about you know max weber's paradigm that she he has for a prophet and and the priest and and uh weber talks about um a prophet being really having the 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 impetus or the the power out of the charisma that she or he has right they're called by god many times they they're they're um they're folks that are used in renewal movements and bringing uh, to light many things and, and revitalizing movements, right? And mm -hmm. we could certainly say that that Mama Leo was one of these prophets, right? Uh, um, uh, spoke for God. Um, and prophets also in Weber's kind of construct, they usually are outside of the lines, right? They're, they, they're not going by the, the tradition, right? The rules, they're called by right. God. These women, Mama Leo was called, they were called by God to do what God had placed in their, in, in their heart, right? Uh, they weren't priests. Priests are more formal. They're recognized. They have that authority that was given to them. They didn't wait for that authority. They went ahead and did the work. Later on, we recognized them, right? We recognized them or they were recognized um, sometimes begrudgingly, but they were recognized, you know, because, you know, you can't, you know, it's that old Spanish saying that you can't stop the sun with your hand. You can't block the sun yes. with your hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The spirit is doing something. Exactly. Okay. The movement uh, or the what Mama Leo had 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 done, and I, and I, it's not like she uh, started a movement, but it was an inspiration. Obviously, we see that they uh, Mama Leo Cortese get together. Later on, we we see Cortese connecting with Camelia Mercado, which is one of the ladies that were was mentioned in one of the workshops, also um, by Reverend Cito Ortiz, connecting their inspiration. And so they didn't wait for a formal recognition to do the work of God, you know, so they didn't conform to that. And, and that I, I felt that was very powerful. And yeah. Daisy does mention that Dr. Machado mentions that in her lecture. You know, just to, to, to hop on to that. Um, I think about um, Rosa Caravaggio. I think, you know, yes. she started a, a ministry um, because a need arose in New York city uh, to, to yes. um, minister to the people that um, were, you know, battling HIV and AIDS and she went out and did it. And, you know, again, people looked at her like she was crazy and are you going to get sick? You're going to, um, you know, get the disease. And she was like, God, and you know, I love her because she's so soft-spoken. She was like, God called me to this and this is what I'm going to do. And so, and she's written a few books, you know, she has a book on Amazon about being a, a caregiver as well. And, and she shares her story about that. I think about Ana Vilafania as well. Yes, um, yes Way Out Ministries. Way Out Ministries mm -hmm. and, and the fact that also she wasn't someone that was recognized. Um, and, and, and this is the thing that we, we can park on right now. All these women that uh, 
weren't celebrated or supported at that time are looked at now as pioneers, right? Are, are looked at now as these amazing, brave women. And really what they were doing was following the call of God. And I, I, mm -hmm. I, I believe that when we really follow Jesus and we really hear him call, we will be led to a holistic justice oriented ministry. Mm -hmm. So people can call us what they want, call us left, leftist, call us woke, call us whatever. Are we called of God? Don't forget that we are also called of God too. And I love mm -hmm. what you said, that they're daring and fearless women who dared the impossible. So the question that I ask for our audience today is, mm -hmm. who will you be celebrating tomorrow that you could have been supporting today? To your point, Liz, um, que lastima. How sad that mm -hmm. we continue to repeat these mistakes, to have these gems in our midst, only to recognize their beauty and their power after they're gone and how, how we desperately need to embrace and to celebrate and to support them now, you know, wow. identify uh, who, who is in the community, uh, love mm -hmm. them, you know, ask, ask, how can we help you? Yes. What do you need? Yeah. Uh, um, and, and by doing so, we are affirming the light that they have and the calling that they yes. have, and we can be allies yes. and rather than competitors. Um, and we yes. as a community desperately need to rid ourselves of those demons. Amen. Amen. And, you know, to that point, David and Liz, we are, you know, supporting the endowment for these Mama Leo lectures and we haven't reached our financial goal. And I really and we all we're believers that we need to put our money where our faith is right and mm -hmm. where our mouth is and the things we speak for and stand for and i shared this in a recent podcast if we're not doing this mm -hmm. as latinos and latinas and supporting our own um and in this case we're elevating our sheroes right these warrior women um, on whose shoulders we all stand mm -hmm. um, because they paved the way for us if we don't step up to the plate and support this work financially these series will not be able to continue because it takes money. And so I, I really want to encourage folks that if, if you believe in Mama Leo's legacy, in this message of taking the church to the streets, of ministering to the least of these, of moving into holistic ministry, of community development, of healing and restoration, especially during these challenging times that we're living in, please consider contributing to the endowment and contribute to those around you who are doing great work and who need not only the moral support and for you to show up and be present, but need the dollars too, because that's important. And we need to start cultivating that mentality of, of investing within our communities, moving from that mentality of scarcity to one of, of more abundant thinking that if the Lord has called us to this, the Lord will provide, the Lord will multiply, right? The bread and the fish. But I, I really want to um, encourage those listening to us to not only be inspired and, and, and be moved by this legacy to move forth with faith and to not wait on someone's okay or permission. You don't need permission. Amen, amen. Is, el Señor te ha llamado, el Señor... Abre las puertas y el amen. Señor provee. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. It reminds me of Anne Frank. We're going to have service up in here today. Oh. It reminds me of <laughs> Anne Frank that she says, no one has gone poor by giving. Stop this mm. in our community. You yep. have to stop this. You can't, you can't send $10. Imagine 100 people sending $10. So that's really important for us to, to remember. To walk our talk. I hear so many people saying all the time, we need so many more resources for our Latino community. Why aren't they talking more about this in our Latino history? Well, support the efforts so that way more of that can be 
And in, in that same frame of mind um, that you mentioned, Belinda, I think of also the gatekeepers that um, Dr. Machado mentioned, right? So, so we on the ground, us Latinos individuals, we have a part in this by, by giving what we can and supporting in presence also what we can. But in addition to that, all the institutions that are out there, you know, the seminaries, the, the, the Bible institutes, all of these um, organizations that have an opportunity to train our people. I, I say, you know, raise some more money so that more of us can go and get a, a, a seminary education without having to mm -hmm. think about the enormous amount of debt that we would have to carry for, for many years. I, I say, you know, make more opportunities for, for, for training that is low core. That it doesn't necessarily mean that you would have to get a, a degree, but yes. maybe some certificate programs, which our people are used to, right? Our people go to uh, um, 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 institutes and they, they want to learn. Our issue in our community is not that we don't want to learn. It's that we value family so much that we're not willing to uproot our family, move to Wichita or wherever, you know, the, the school is to go get a degree that when you come out might not necessarily pay, give you a job that pays you the money that you need to pay it back. So we have to exactly. get about all of these things. And if these institutions really value our voice, like they say they do, like some of them say they do because some of them still don't see us, but the ones that see us and they say that they care about what we have to say, you know, put your efforts where your mouth is and start developing some scholarships. Amen. And, and talk to the community, talk to the community leaders. What is it that the, the people need? Our ed is working with a lot of seminaries to allow the students that are going through institute to also be allowed to go to seminary and then finish up a degree. That's creative thinking. That's collaboration. We need to do more yes, of that yes. if we want to see our community really rise to their potential. The, the other thing... Yes. Is well to appreciate lo que tenemos, you know, mm -hmm. to appreciate who we have. Like uh, there are people who, it's very amazing that the, the human nature is to not see and value that who's in the midst of you. Uh, so they couldn't see Jesus. Isn't he, was this Joseph's mm -hmm. son? Is he, is he the carpenter's kid? They were blinded to his, his light. They were blinded to his virtue. Hey, you uh, love the people that are there. Pro provide for a, a sabbatical. For your for your ministers, uh, you know, pay for a vacation so they can get away. Um, tend to them because they are resources in your own community. It's not around That's the it. corner. A lot of times you're looking for a hotshot preacher or ex ex person. No, these are the people who are embedded in our communities. Are deeply mm -hmm. rooted. They are sacrificing day by day. Bless them. Yes. Amen. Amen. The Lord is speaking right now. I hope you have the ears to hear people out there. Hallelujah. Gloria a Dios. Wow. Amen. The subjects. Hopefully we can uh, kind of expand on a lot of the things we, we've talked about. A lot of things are really close to our hearts. We love the Lord. We love the church. And we want to and we want to make sure that those that minister are, are also taken care of. And, and so that's our heart right now. And we're we're getting together um every month and we're offering kind of a way of coming into a, a place of of discussion uh a place of place of mutual support that we call la mesa and we opened this up um we opened it up a few months ago a couple of months ago it was kind of a soft launch we didn't tell everyone but now we're opening it up to all of those that like to come and um, uh, the Mesa is a place of mutual support, Christ-centered support uh, for those that are working uh, for the Lord. And uh, we're going to have our next Mesa on February 28th from 7 to 8.15. If you'd like to join us, drop us a line and we can send you an invitation, a Zoom invitation. We're having an excellent time um, just getting together with folks from California, Florida, Washington, D.C., uh, all over, all over the place. And so we want to invite you to to this. And and we're not charging anything, by the way. <laughs> this is not like, OK, we're, we're just having folks coming together. And so we wanted to make sure you you knew this. Um, also, we have some news from Union Theological Seminary. Uh, Liz, would you would you like to share that news? <laughs> 
Sure. We're so excited that Union um, has decided that they are going to waive the application fee for anyone that is was moved by the Mama uh, Leo Latinx Lecture Series and wants to learn more about religion and culture and society, how that all intersects. Um, so there's a, a number of, of degrees that they offer on the master's level and on the doctoral level. So if you're interested, please do go to the, uh, the link that's uh, noted on, on the bottom of your screen and you'll be able to apply and um, and not have to pay the, the fee. That's great. So Union has blessed us with that, but they've also blessed us with the content of the inaugural lecture series, uh, the material, the workshops, the keynote, all of that. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to play half of Daisy's lecture. The idea was to really showcase Daisy's lecture, and we're, we want to play a part of it uh, so that you could see it. We don't want to simply just talk about it. We want to play a part of it. It is on the Union uh, Theological uh, YouTube channel for your consideration, but we want to be part of the folks that distribute this message and this knowledge and this education. And that's why we're Amen. one of the distributors of, of this. Um, so it's wonderful stuff. And we like to break it down too. Uh, so we love for you to email us or uh, if you want to put it in the chat at some point, uh, something in, in Facebook in the chat, we'd love to hear from you and, and discuss those different points, historical, theological points, and, and just uh, things that have to do with Latino identity. I think it's it's so important for us to to be able to discuss that, you know, and, and empower our people. And I would just like to remind everyone that we have a lot of gems in the Latino community, male, female, children, young people. Let's not overlook them because we're always looking to other people to think that they're the only ones that have anything to offer. Um, Robert Chow Romero talks about the uh, community cultural wealth in his book, The Brown Church. So let's let's do a little bit better in looking at the gems that we have in our community. Um, we can celebrate them a little more. And like we've all said, we can do a lot better in our support. Amen. Reverend Dave, would you lead us in prayer? Absolutely, absolutely. Heavenly Father, um, we are so indebted to our the four mothers and four fathers before us whose shoulders we stand on and uh, and are moved by their sacrifice. Uh, we thank you for the Mamaleos and the Enicotisis, Lord Father, and for the Daisy Machados and the Belinda Pasafaros and the Dr. Liz Rios and, and the uh, Rosa Caraballos of the world and our lives who've touched us and continue to move us with their exemplary leadership. Uh, we ask you that you continue to open wide doors of, of ministry and opportunity and support and affirmation and resources and blessing, Lord God, to their lives and, and to our lives, my God. Help us, Lord Father, to, as the psalmist said, to number our days and to understand that uh, time is this, like the song says, is a ticking, and that we need to, Lord, uh, be able to be courageous in difficult times uh, such as this, uh, as we struggle, Lord Father, with, uh, with a pandemic, and even now as we witness the aggression that is this shameful naked aggression that is occurring in with our sisters and brothers in Ukraine, Lord yes. Father, that is tipping the world further and further into chaos and to violence, Lord Father. We per, we bind the spirits yes, of war and of mm. violence, yes. of, 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 of division and of of pathology and, and narcissism, my God. We we ask you, Lord God, for peace. Yes, Lord yes. Father, in the world, we ask you for peace in the nations, oh, peace yes. in our hearts, yes. Lord Father, because we know that at times we are the problem, Lord Father, mm. that we yes. too have our own prejudice, and mm. we too are guilty, and we too fall short of the glory of God. So we repent, yes. 
Lord Father, of our own uh, violence and our own uh, dispositions uh, of having our own way. And we ask you, Spirit of the Lord, to bring uh, shalom into this world, of the tinkun, as our uh, healing, the repairing of the world, as our Jewish sisters and brothers would share. Thank you, Spirit of God, and I ask you that we will not only pray, but that we will work, Lord Father, for justice and work Hallelujah. for peace, Lord Father, and not just uh, intercede, but to, to live, Lord Father, by the way we act and by what we do and how we speak, Lord Father, to represent you now and always. And we ask yes. this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And without further ado, the Reverend Dr. Daisy Machado. With an introduction from Reverend Dr. Samuel Cruz, Associate Professor at Union Theological so good Seminary. Good afternoon. I hope that you have all been enjoying this day as I have been. It's amazing the role that Latina women have had in our communities. They've been foundational to our faith and to all our organizations. And I'm now reminded of the story of the wedding at Canaan, where somebody asked, why did you leave the best wine for last? And with all due respect to everything that has happened before, I think we're bringing the best of the wine now with the uh, keynote address by Dr. Daisy Machado, who is professor of church history at Union Theological Seminary. She was the first Latina ordained in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ in the Northeast region and has served many congregations. She was also the first executive director of the Hispanic Theological Initiative. She is currently also the executive director of the Hispanic Summer Program, and it has grown in leaps and bounds since she took over its leadership. I have to say that I remember my mentor, Dr. Otto, the late Dr. Otto Maduro, once telling me, Daisy should publish all her lectures and sermons. Uh, there's no one who can speak like her and lecture like her. And I truly believe this. I'm not saying this just to make Daisy feel good, but it's the reality. I think because of patriarchy and machismo, uh, she hasn't been used in many Latino churches and it's a loss to many of us. So I, it is my distinct honor and privilege to present to you this afternoon, Dr. Daisy Machado. Muchas gracias, Samuel. Muchas gracias y saludos a todas, a todos this afternoon. I'm so delighted to be here with, uh, thank you, Samuel, no pressure <laughs> for your words, but I am truly grateful for this opportunity and inviting me to make, to, that to so I could be a part of this inaugural lecture. It is an honor for me for several reasons. I'm glad to present this address in the institution where I have spent the last 14 years of my career. And as Samuel has said, where I had the opportunity to serve as the first Latina academic dean of Union Theological Seminary. I'm also glad to deliver this lecture because I grew up in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg to be more precise, in a Pentecostal congregation of the Assemblies of God called Iglesia Cristiana Misionera, where immigrant families like my own created not only a community of faith with other immigrants, but where my family that had left Cuba right before the revolution was also able to find a home. The Puerto Rican families that made up the majority of the members of that small Pentecostal congregation we're living in a diaspora, so they understood what it meant to try to create home in an environment that was hostile to us because we were not from here, because we were seen as outsiders, as interlopers, not quite American, despite the fact that those same Puerto Ricans were all US citizens. And there is still another, even more personal reason why this inaugural lecture is so meaningful for me. The woman in whose honor this lecture series is being named, Leoncia Rosado Rousseau, properly known as Mama Leo, represents an early generation of Pentecostal Latina leaders that was not only devoted to their faith, obedient to their call and tireless in their work, but they were also daring and fearless women who believed the impossible was possible. I want to take a moment to remind all of us here today of what daunting odds these women faced and yet how they persevered to impact not only communities, but even nations. Pentecostal movement, as Samuel has said, owes all of these women a great debt, and I feel this must be emphasized in this first gathering. And having said this, allow me a personal privilege 
to specifically name another of these early Pentecostal women leaders from the early decades of the 20th century, a contemporary of Mamaleo who focused her ministry not in Puerto Rico, not in New York City, but in Cuba. In 1939, a Pentecostal woman from Naranjito, Puerto Rico left the island with her two small sons and traveled to, to Cuba to preach the gospel. Her name was Belen Nieves and her name has sadly been forgotten in the archives of Pentecostal women missionaries in the early 20th century. Yet she would become someone whose ministry would greatly impact the life of my mother and subsequently myself. She arrived in Cuba in 1939 after receiving her call in a revival service in which she was shown a map of Cuba and heard a voice telling her to go and preach. After receiving this vision to evangelize the sister island, she arrived to Camagüey, Cuba to preach and my mother and my grandmother were the first converts to the message being proclaimed by Lermana Belén. Belén Nieves would go on to found the first Pentecostal Assemblies of God Church in the city of Camagüey in Cuba, and by her side was my mother, who she empowered to also preach and teach and develop her own leadership, which my mother carried on doing in that Pentecostal church in Brooklyn, where she provided me with a model for female leadership. I mentioned Hermana Belén because like Mama Leo, whose ministry began a few years earlier in 1932, when she also received her call on the revival service, these female Pentecostal preachers and missionaries were part of a unique generation of Puerto Rican women leaders in the Pentecostal movement locally in Puerto Rico, the diaspora of New York, and internationally in places like Cuba. Theirs is a story of deep and powerful faith that would dare to challenge the limitations placed on women in the Pentecostal church in the early decades of the 20th century. But more than that, it empowered them to think and do what many Pentecostal male leaders had not done. Hermana Belén traveled to Cuba alone in 1939 with two small children, with no great economic support or big denominational backing, to carry on the work that she felt that God had called her to do. And truly, Hermana Belén, was, Belén Nieves was a pioneer. And I want to say her name here today with all of you as witnesses to the tireless work that she did despite the great poverty Cubans and all Latin Americans were facing in the late 1930s. She followed God's call despite the fact that her denomination provided little economic support to assure that she and her sons could put food on their table. Yet she persevered and did indeed establish that first Pentecostal church that became the home church of both my mother, my grandmother, and eventually my father. She also provided us as a family with a link to the Pentecostal movement, not only in Cuba, but in New York City and Brooklyn, when my parents migrated to this country. As you can see, the history of these early Pentecostal women is in many ways very personal to me. And in the work of Belen Nieves, we find that particular female embodiment of the gospel that she profoundly believed in. Mama Leo, Belen Nieves, and the other Pentecostal women of the early 1900s were able to bring together in their ministry and leadership ways to engage communities and to promote the values of the gospel. These faithful Pentecostal women were truly pioneers who not only would impact the ways of Pentecost that Pentecostalism was being expressed, but all, would also work with different communities where the gospel they preached would take root. This was certainly the case with Mamaleo, who worked with those that society had long abandoned Mamaleo's work with drug addicts, alcoholics, gang members, ex sex workers, ex-convicts was, was a population what, that would had mostly in a majority also been in jail, was both unexpected and easily, not easily understood and was criticized. And in order to help us better understand the context of this Pentecostal movement in Puerto Rico and then in diaspora of New York City, I want to talk now a little bit about the origins and the migration of Pentecostal to the city of New York. And in many ways, this lecture will be about the embodiment, the female body, and location, place, as two important pieces of the history that needs to be told. We know that the emigration of by Puerto Ricans from the island was happening even before the Spanish-American War of 1898. But it was in the early decades of the 20th century that a significant number of Puerto Ricans from the countryside and urban centers of the island began to migrate from the, from, uh, to the northern metropolises of the United States. Although small groups of political exiles had emigrated throughout the last third of the 19th century, it was not until after the North American occupation of the island in 1898 that critical social, political, and economic transformation in Puerto Rico triggered an increase in the numbers of people leaving for continental shores. The relegating of Puerto Rico to the status of a possession of the United States 
especially contributed to immigration as the U.S. introduced changes that impacted all sectors of life for Puerto Ricans producing a new marginal population due to a growth in population coupled with limited resources. By 1900, employment, unemployment was very high. And by 1920s, the presence of large U.S. sugar monopolies indirectly encouraged thousands of small farmers to leave their farms and produced a large class of unemployed farm workers displaced by new machinery being introduced in the cultivation of sugar and tobacco. This meant that production increased, but the labor force did not. The depression hit the Puerto Rican economy hard, reducing both sugar and tobacco production in such a manner that by 1939, the tobacco industry was almost non-existent. Clearly, the movements of people from Puerto Rico to the United States responded basically to economic conditions on the island, which in turn created a marginal population outside of the stable workforce. The search for economic opportunity once again became the motivating factor propelling numbers of Puerto Ricans to migrate, first to the island's urban centers and then across the ocean. For Puerto Ricans, the attraction of New York City was largely economic. Job opportunities, above all, loom as the single most important factor encouraging potential migration. By 1927, all 48 states reported the presence of Puerto Rican-born individuals, and by the mid-1950s, estimates show that some 425,000 Puerto Ricans lived in the United States, 80% of whom lived in New York City, and about half of that population was female. Women held a special place in the early Puerto Rican settlement of New York City, often providing links between the island and mainline enclaves. Pivotal in retaining ethnicity through the transmission of language, customs, and cultural traditions within familial settings, women also functioned as part of an informal informational network. These same Puerto Rican women, when confronted by the economic realities of an overwhelmingly poor community, Close to 25% of these migrant women went to work outside the home in factories, laundries, and restaurants. Despite the fact that Puerto Rican women worked outside their homes, they saw this as an extension of their role as homemaker, since women were expected to fulfill their traditional role as wives and mothers as they had previously done in their island home. It is important to note that during all of this economic and political upheaval, there were also profound changes taking place in the religious life of Puerto Ricanos on the island. The Puerto Rican denominations brought to Puerto Rico by North Americans took hold. And in a matter of decades after the first foreign missionaries arrived on US warships in 1898, the Protestant churches in Puerto Rico had been developing their own native leadership. There were many revivals in Puerto Rico, but there were two specific that had tremendous impact. One of them was in 1916, another one that was between 32 and 33. And these further cemented the authority and the influence of Puerto Rican Protestant pastors and lay leaders and helped to motivate and promote a Puerto Rican brand of Protestantism with its own hymnody, its own use of musical instruments, la guitarra, la maraca, all of these were introduced to, and it was a religious fervor and, and it was in many ways proved to be the genesis of a Puerto Rican Protestant tradition that in many ways also stood in defiance of the missionary legacy. These revivals gave these Puerto Rican Protestants a new evangelical identity and a new evangelical tradition with a new interpretation of authority within this newly forming tradition. Not only was there a theological shift in worship shaped by new theological insights, but the revivals also shifted the relations of power between North American missionaries and the Puerto Rican Protestants. What I call the missionary imaginary already in place had created an imbalance of power between the North American Protestant missionaries and Puerto Rican pastors. In other research I have done, it was clear that this missionary imaginary made it so that missionaries did not see the indigenous leaders as their equal, which was reflected not only in how they were, much they were paid or how they treated the Puerto Rican pastors, but also in the kind of leadership formation they promoted or did not. I bring up these issues of power and control by U.S. missionaries to remind us that the revivals that took place in Puerto Rico in the early decades of the 20th century influenced the Puerto Rican pastors and the laity 
to become independent of foreign missionary control and seek to define their own vision for the work they believe God was calling them to do. And this was especially true for Pentecostals. This was also true of the women who took on leadership roles in the churches in Puerto Rico and who then immigrated to New York City. Research shows that in the 1930s and 40s, there were some 25 Puerto Rican Protestant churches in New York City, most of them Pentecostal. But we know that Pentecostalism arrived on the island decades, decades earlier. The historical narrative tells us that Pentecostalism first began among Puerto Rican migrant workers and sugarcane cutters in the diaspora in Hawaii and Northern California, and that then spread when they returned to Puerto Rico. This was the case with Dionisia Feliciano and the first Latina ordained by the Assemblies of God, who with her husband, Salomon, had been Puerto Ricans working on sugar plantations in Hawaii, where they converted in a revival in Hawaii, they converted to Pentecostalism. They both became ordained Assemblies of God ministers in San Jose, California in 1914, and later returned to Puerto Rico, where they helped Juan Lugo pioneer the young Pentecostal movement. However, I want to make this fact because we're talking about women and the impact of women. So let me share this with you. Nine years before Dionisia and her husband returned to Puerto Rico to work with Juan Lugo, it was another woman named Jenny Mishler, a Euro-American missionary evangelist from an Azusa Street daughter mission in Los Angeles who began preaching the Pentecostal message in Puerto Rico in 1909. Sadly, Mishler's experience in Puerto Rico was a difficult one. She began her preaching in Santa Isabel, but when she began to attract converts, the priest and lay Catholic leaders began ridiculing her and persecuting anyone who attended her evangelistic services. And in addition to this opposition, the male Catholic leaders used their connections to create a hostile environment for Mishler. After a difficult 15-month period, and her letters show how much she suffered in her prayers and how much this affected her, where she received almost no support from her congregation in Los Angeles, sadly, Mishler decided to leave Puerto Rico. And while she was not able to leave a permanent mission, it is important to note that Jenny Mishler's Pentecostal preaching was the first or maybe one of the first times the Pentecostal message was preached in Puerto Rico. The Latinx Pentecostal story in New York City was different from that in Puerto Rico, in that the largest Latino Pentecostal denomination in New York City prior to 1939 was not the Assemblies of God, but the Latin American Council of Christian Churches. And the main leader of that movement was the powerful Mexican evangelist Francisco Lazabal, who led a revival in New York City in 1937, reaching thousands of Puerto Ricans in depression-stricken Spanish Harlem. In an online program by the Latino Leadership Circle, which I listened to from October 2021, Jonathan Roque, who also I saw led two workshops at this conference, said that he grew up in the Damascus Christian Church under the leadership of Mama Leo. And he confirms that when Leo arrived in New York City, she worked in the ministry being led by Francisco La Sabal in Spanish Harlem. And it is precisely in New York City, 1939, that Leo's story begins to take shape in an urban context of New York as she begins to take on the role of an urban evangelistic preacher and social activist. Leoncia Rosado was born in 1912 in Alta, Puerto Rico, and was the second of five children born to Gumercinda Santiago Ferrer and Manuel Rivera Marrero. Like other women in this early generation of Pentecostal leaders, Leo also received her call in a revival, as I've already said. Hers was in 1932 in the Disciples of Christ Church, which was followed by a time of doing ministry in some of the poorest barrios in Puerto Rico. Having been foretold in a vision that she was destined to carry God's word across the ocean, 1935, she left the island for New York to continue her work as missionary and evangelist. She preached on street corners, offered her testimony to the glory of God, visited the sick, assisted in the general organization of the church. She also traveled to the Dominican Republic and other Latin American countries. Yet we know, and she testified in, this, in, a, in a survey, in an interview that was done, that despite her gifts and her dedication, she was limited by her gender and could only address the congregation from the floor and not from the pulpit. Yet she remained steadfast in her work. At the beginning of the Second World War, Leo marries Roberto Rosado, who was an elder in the church. And as can be expected, Leo's ministry was closely tied to the realities of the Puerto Rican community in New York City, which was in its majority 
and unskilled working class living on meager wages. The labor shortages brought on by the Second World War brought over 400,000 foreign contract workers, though very few of them were Puerto Ricans, and scholars argue that the departure of these workers after the, after the war created the vacuum that was filled by Puerto Ricans who continued to concentrate in blue-collar, low-paying jobs. The war years were very important to the charismatic Leo, who now became pastor of the Damascus Christian Church, an event which Leo herself interpreted as a plan that God had laid out for her, a plan that included the induction of her husband into the army for service in the war, and a decision by two other male leaders, principal leaders, Fernando Noriega and Belen Camacho, that she be chosen as the one to continue as the pastor of the congregation upon the departure of her husband. It must be noted that even though Latinas have been ordained in the Assemblies of God since at least 1914, yet prior to the war, it was uncommon for a single woman to pastor her own church or be ordained in the pastoral ministry. Typically, women were licensed rather than ordained and served alongside their husbands as interim pastors or as pastors in small congregations. The fact that Leo's husband, who was ordained, supported her leadership as the pastor of the congregation when he left to serve in the war is important. But I think it's especially significant that two primary male leaders in the congregation also supported Leo as the one to take over as the pastor of Damascus Christian Church. The Damascus Christian Church, with Leo, which Leo and Olazabal helped to establish in the 1930s, would become the council of Damascus Christian Churches in the 1950s under the leadership of Leo and her husband, Roberto. No doubt that the resistance of women ministers serving as pastors of congregations was a battle these Pentecostal women faced on a daily basis, which prompted some of these women to create their own female-led denominations. Perhaps the most well-known one would be Mita, the Grupo de Mita. Leo was now pastor of a congregation and eventually became bishop of the council, but, did, did, did not, but this did not mean that her struggle to be accepted as equal with her male counterparts had ended. She is quoted to have said of this situation in an interview done in 1985 this following. She said, we women are treated as third class soldiers by some of our male counterparts. While we can say that Pentecostal churches in New York City in the 1930s and 40s served as a sanctuary for those Puerto Ricans who had experienced the loneliness, isolation and personal struggles caused by migration, Leo's growing ministry to drug addicts, alcoholics, gang members, et cetera, et cetera, opened the door to new ways of serving the community while it also redefined the role of women's ministry. This was a major turning point in her ministry, as was the creation of the Youth Crusade 1957, which was one of the first major church-sponsored drug rehabilitation programs in the United States. According to Leo, both of these events were foretold in a vision in which the Lord took her to the edge of a river where God indicated that she was to retrieve enormous quantities of carrots from the waters. She agonized over this task and explained to God that she could not do it. But God said to her, yes, you can. Continue. Take them out. And take them out, she did. When the Christian Youth Crusade was initiated, Damascus Christian Church had expanded to include branches in other boroughs of the city, and it was sustained from funding within the church. It's very important. It was a self-sustained program. The major center was Damascus Christian Church in the Bronx, but there was also an upstate location called Mountaindale to which recovering addicts could go. Again, Mama Leo faced obstacles and resistance from within the congregation for this community-focused ministry, and in that same interview in 1985, Leo said the following. Our church, she says, was like any church like any other. It didn't work with alcoholics, etc. I came and told them of my vision. I understand these are alcoholics and lost souls and the lowest people in society. But God wants us to do this work. And they said, not here. No, no, not here. And I said to them, yes, here, because God mandates it of us. Leo was not only refocusing the church's gaze onto the community, but was actually taking the church to the streets. She was opening the doors of the church to those that no one else valued or cared about. She expanded the role of the church from serving only as a spiritual refuge, refuge to a place where the physical realities of addictions and violence, antisocial behavior, were now recognized and seen as important components of the church's response to God's call to serve and witness. 
In essence, what Leo was doing in her ministry and the work of the Youth Crusade, Crusade was a type of community development that sought to respond to the repeated ruptures and dismantling of familial, individual, and communal networks brought about by Puerto Rican migration. She was also aiding in the stabilization of the Puerto Rican community at this significant point in its historical development. And I want to make a pause here to allow us to really let this sink in and to really try to fully understand and to grasp the importance of this ministry and also to see how daring and how audacious it was. By reaching out to, by providing help to those, that particular demographic of addicts, gang members, etc., Leo was confronting the reality of a capitalist neoliberal society by daring to acknowledge that those that U.S. society had, ident had identified had identified as unfit, surplus, and disposable were taken care of. Current so scholars who study modern capitalist states argue that those who are identified in this way as unfit, as surplus, as disposable, these scholars say that when they're identified these ways, societies then seek to erase them from public consciousness and leave them to rot in slums, and you can go on, in slums, in immigration centers, in detention centers, in prisons, the list goes on, and, uh, and where they are stripped of dignity. These same folks are also warehoused in mass incarceration due to their location at the bottom of the urban order. Of course, I am using 21st century terminology to examine Leo's Youth Crusade ministry, but the language used does not alter the reality that the Puerto Rican community in New York City was facing in the 1950s and 60s and 70s when Leo was ministering. Today we see the escalating results of this concept of being socially superfluous called superfluidity in the mass incarceration of Latinos and black men in this nation who are indeed at the bottom of the urban order and indeed are being erased from public consciousness. While we do not know if Leo and her congregation also saw that the reality of the addicted youth they served or the gangbangers or the ex-cons was the result of and a response to poverty, despair, racism, and lack of opportunity the Puerto Rican community faced in New York City during those decades, what we do know is that Leo refused to just close herself off and stay inside the walls of the church. She clearly showed that she was willing to obey God's call to wade deep into the waters and to retrieve those who needed to be saved and to do this in a holistic way, focusing on both soul and body. Everyone was important in Mama Leo's ministry, and she created a place for them within the church. And this is a very important aspect of the legacy that Mama Leo has left us for the 21st century in the nation state that we are currently living in. Yet as we take the opportunity in this conference to remember and to acknowledge and to celebrate the extraordinary ministerial work done by Leoncia Rosado Rousseau, I think it is also important to situate her ministry as a woman with the broader conversation about the leadership of women in the church today. Surely, the work that Mama Leo did as pastor, as evangelist, social advocate, community organizer, began well over 70 years ago, yet it, yet if examined within the context of studies done about women's leadership in the last 25 years or so, it can provide us with insights about the skills that she possessed that made her ministry such a success. And in identifying these skills, we can also garner a better understanding of the ways that women lead in the church and reinforce the, the key idea that women continue to be of great impact and importance to the ministry of congregations, denominations, and concilios across the nation. In essence, we can begin by simply confirming that women have indeed changed the landscape of Christianity in the United States, in Puerto Rico, in Latin America, in Latino congregations, but also in Euro-American congregations. While we hear so many times about el machismo Latino, I know it exists, I'm not saying it's not, okay, so chill. What I want to say here is that while we hear a lot about el machismo Latino, which exists, and I have been I have experienced it firsthand. But what we may forget is that there is also a very distinct Anglo-Protestant legacy still present in U.S. Christianity 
that can be traced in part to the religious convictions of the founding communities of the United States, which has provided the implicit theology that for generations has resisted the leadership of women in the church in the United States, the Anglo church specifically. In other words, the resistance to women in the pulpit or women in key leadership positions is not just a Latino thing. And research has clearly shown that resistance to the ordination of women and their full leadership within Anglo, within Anglo Protestant churches can be traced to the more religiously conservative values of the United States, which have prescribed a particular role to women. And one of these roles is the binary gendered role assigned to women, which, contra which consists of the binary of public versus private space, overflowing into public versus private expression. Women have categorically been limited and diminished as a gender to the realm of the private. They are caregivers, they are homemakers, they are están en el seno del hogar, this very private space. This is the idea of the public for men and the private for women as a sign social spaces can be traced all the way to Aristotle and has served through the centuries to perpetuate a gendered separation that is still hard to erase. The current climate of Western Protestantism seems to still prioritize the relegation of female work to the private realm and even in those instances where female pastors are encouraged on the public platform the rhetoric rhetoric is still expected to be to abide by the societal rules of public versus private expression gaston espinosa when writing about pentecostal women's leadership has called this binary this reality a paradoxical domesticity whereby he says women are exhorted to be both end times prophetesses and evangelists in the public sphere and yet to be devoted mothers and good wives in the private sphere again i want to bring this into our analysis because misogyny and patriarchy is not just about latinos the north american missionaries that brought protestantism to puerto rico and to all of our spanish-speaking countries very much embodied ideas about women's leadership as less than male leadership and made it a part of the legacy they gave to our native churches. This was no less true for the North American Pentecostal male leaders at the turn of the 1900s. Despite the movement of the spirit at Azusa Street in 1906, which launched Pentecostalism across the United States, gendered roles were still a reality and Pentecostal women may have been ordained as early as 1914, but they were still not given equal opportunity nor equal status. In trying to better define this idea of a binary of public and private to define male versus female roles in the church, scholars have redefined these binaries and have used terms, the terms of ministering authority and ruling authority. In other words, women can minister, but women cannot rule. This binary is often associated with sociologist Max Weber, who had a typology of, of prophet and priest. And he used this prophet and priest typology to describe two different types of religious leaders. Weber describes a prophet as one who lays claim to authority by virtue of personal revelation and charisma, while a priest is one who lays claim to authority by virtue of his or her service in a sacred tradition. This means that women can be prophets by virtue of the gifts of the spirit, meaning they can teach and preach, but to assume the function of priest meaning to have administrative oversight, which is part of a sacred tradition of authority held by the church has been, and I dare say still is, problematic for many in the 21st century church. But Leo was clear in her ministry. She refused to be boxed in by these prescribed roles. She not only took on the administrative function within her church as pastor and then later as bishop, but she also assumed a very public role as evangelist and community activist, focusing on the most marginalized in her Puerto Rican community. 